Good morning, FarmCon. <laughs> a little bit better. Um, so quick observation is, thank you, by the way, for allowing me to wear jeans. That is so much appreciated. Can I take the jacket off, too? Yeah? OK. It ends there. Don't worry. I'm not going any further. That's it. Um, so happy to be here. As I look out at this group, a thousand or so people, I really do see the future of agriculture. And this has been an area that, for me, we unfortunately don't pay enough attention to in this country. You have been a segment that has experienced enormous productivity increases over the course of the last 60 years. But of late, there are some interesting dynamics that I think are going to change this industry very rapidly. I had some fascinating conversations last night with many of you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with me what you're doing, what you're experiencing. A few quick observations. One, you are at this enormous precipice right now, a generational precipice. Talked to a lot of third and fourth family uh, farmers and talked about what they're doing and what they're thinking about doing going forward. I want to touch on that generational issue. Number two, there is an incredible demographic shift going on right now that beyond all the technology we're going to talk about is going to impact not just this industry, but us globally as a socioeconomic engine in ways that I think we're only beginning to now appreciate. So I want to talk about that demographic shift as well. Number three, and these are the pillars sort of of what we're going to talk about for the next three hours. Yeah. It could take three hours. I'm going to go quickly here. Um, is AI and what AI is doing. Look, quick poll, a couple of quick polls here. Work with me on these two because I really want to see where we're at. How many of you have used ChatGPT some just to see what it's like? Raise your hands. It's about half of the group, right? So the other half, I would counsel you, make this part of what you're doing just to understand where the world is going. Uh, Kevin, I love it. Gradually and then all of a sudden. Every so often, we are at one of these thresholds of history where things have happened gradually for a long time. And during the course of my existence on this planet, the last 65 years, what I've seen in technology is nothing but prelude to, I think, what's coming over the next 10 to 20 years. And I want to convince you of this, not just through dogma, but by showing you some of the data. We are at a point where without the application of AI, we simply cannot create a sustainable future for ourselves in the developed world or in the developing world. So we're going to look at those three pillars and understand how these generational issues, how these demographic shifts, and how AI is going to impact what you're doing. But I want to be careful here, because to tell you a bit about myself, so my 13th book is coming out in February. My dad, who's now 93 <clears throat> and still kicking it, God bless him, uh, when, when book 13 was finally uh, ready to come out, and I told Dad about it. He said, he said, Tom, you know, I'm so proud of you. I never would have guessed that this fantastic, but God, if only you would read 13 books through your entire academic career. <laughs> so I wasn't the brightest light in the bulb. What I am is a really good observer, and I get to spend a lot of my time, and what Delphi Group does primarily is look at emerging trends so that we can make them practical. I don't want to blue sky it on you, because we can go 30, 40, 50 years down the road and talk about all kinds of crazy shit. We're not going to do that. The flying car is always five years out, right? Let's talk about what's practical, uh, what's likely to happen over the next five to 10 years, and what is most going to impact your life, your industry, your investments, what you're doing going forward. And let me show you the catalyst for all of that. You ready for this? So grab your smartphone. Does anyone not have a cellular device on their person right now? Raise your hand if you don't have a cellular device on your person right now. Anyone? That crazy, look at that, not a single hand is going up. Okay, so grab your cell phone, your smartphone, grab it. This is audience participation, guys. You gotta grab your smartphone for this, okay. Answer honestly, how many of you, before even getting out of bed this morning, grabbed this device and checked for email, for social media posts, for text messages? How many of you, raise your hands, before even getting out of bed? That, like 70% of you. How many of you actually sleep with this on the pillow next to you? Raise them, go ahead, go for it. There's like six single people in the room. Yeah. When did that, stop and think about this for a minute. Come on, when did that happen? When did you start sleeping with your phone? When did this become your oxygen mask, right? You can't leave home without this and not have a panic attack, am I right? Have you ever, I mean, how many of you have done this at least several times a day? Yeah. This has become our oxygen mask, right? Without this, we cannot survive. That's not a technological shift. What is that? 
is not a technological shift. What is it? It's a behavioral shift, right? Ultimately, what I want to show you is that behavior drives technology. It's not the other way around. We want to believe it is. But it's that change in behavior that we can't predict. I can predict, and you can predict, and we can all, using Moore's Law and all kinds of other um, uh, frameworks, we can predict what the future of technology is going to look like. I think I can tell you with great certainty what 2050 will look like, what 2100, uh, 2100 will look like, based on technological change. What I can't predict, what none of us can predict, is what the behavior will look like. So that's where we're going to go. That's what we're going to play with today. Um, ready to go down that journey with me? Have some fun with it? All right. And, and look, you know, challenge some of these ideas. This is not gospel. Um, so let's go to that first. Let's go to that first slide. Let's bring that up. I want to ask you a, a question, and again, I want an honest answer from you. Uh, are we up on the screen? Because I can't see the screen. There we are. Cool. Okay. So answer honestly. How many of you believe this sentiment? Does anyone raise your hand? It's okay. It'll be the same person who doesn't have a cell phone. Yeah. Of course not. We don't want. But what if I were to tell you that while we don't believe this, it's how we behave. Day to day, we behave as though all the good stuff has already been invented. So to go forward, let me take you back first. I'm going to take you back to the 1950s, late 50s, uh, early 60s, around that era. How many of you were on the planet back then? Come on, there's got to be more of you. Really? Shit, I'm getting old. Wow. All right. I'll give you a little background then for the rest of you that weren't, weren't around. Um, so I want you to tell me, I'm going to show you some devices here. I want you to tell me what these devices are. And just yell it out. What is this? What are we looking at? It's a computer, right. Which computer is it? you know which one it is? This is actually 1945, circa right after the Second World War. It's the ENIAC. ENIAC, yeah, someone said that. Yes, the ENIAC, so the first commercial computer. Um, this is a circa 1940s computer, still being used primarily, same kind of era of computer being used in the 1950s. So we got that one. What is this? Anybody? Take a wild ass guess. Come on. Someone. A hard drive. Thank you. Absolutely. It is the first uh, commercially available portable hard drive because you can fly away with it. <laughs> Remember Pan Am? Yeah, you're as old as me if you do. Um, what was the storage capacity of this device? Anyone want to gander? What was the storage capacity of the IBM 350 in 1960? How much could it hold? Someone said two megabytes. You're close. Actually, three megabytes. Three, and, and the accountants and the scientists, they'd scratch their heads. They'd say, where the hell are we going to find three megabytes of data? Right? You've got more onboard memory in your microwave oven than, you, than this thing had. Um, so put yourself in that mindset. I want you to take you back to the 1950s, because I want you to think 1950s right now. Okay, you're back in the 1950s, and we're here talking about what 2020 will look like. Keep that in mind. So let me show you the trajectory of technology, which I find absolutely fascinating for one overwhelmingly simple data point. <clears throat> so as you as you look at this chart, what you're seeing is the number of user computing devices from 1960 to the present day. Today we have on the planet well in excess of 10 billion uh, <clears throat> user-based computing devices, and, and 7 billion of them are these things, right? Cellular devices of one sort or another. See that line, that diagonal line? That shows you the increase on a logarithmic scale. So could you give me a formula that a five-year-old would understand that describes the increasing trajectory of user community devices decade over decade from 1960 to the present day? What's that formula? A five-year-old could understand it. Add a zero every decade. One order of magnitude, right? So given that, you know we're at 10 billion a day. How many devices do you think we'll have by the year 2100? Anyone want to do the math? Yell it out if you've got a number. What do you think? Someone said a boatload? Is that what you said? A boatload? Well beyond billions and trillions here. <clears throat> you will have 100 times, get this, as many user computing devices as there are grains of sand on all the world's beaches. 
That's the math. And I guarantee you that number is pretty damn close to precise. Because we're seeing that order of magnitude decade, decade over decade increase. It's not even slowing, it's not slowing down, it's increasing, it's accelerating. The question is not, will we have this many devices? We'll be ingesting them, they'll be in our food products. I mean, my kids, my Gen Zers, they want, when they go, go to the grocery store, they want a barcode in every piece of fruit and vegetable to know exactly where it came from, how it was grown, how many natural resources went into the thing. I mean, everything to them is this blockchain-enabled world, a fabric that surrounds them. That's what these devices will do. They'll be part of the fabric of our world. Everything will have a digital self, a digital twin. You're thinking right now, come on, that's ridiculous, Tom. And yet, and yet, I can hold 300,000 of those IBM 350s between my two fingers today. I'll submit to you that I have infinitely greater stature standing here today saying we'll be at that number by 2100 than I ever would have in 1960 saying that we'd be at 10 billion ENIACs today. Am I right? Because you would have thought me back then patently absurd. You said, there's no way we can have 10 billion ENIACs. Where are we gonna find all that metal you know, that'll require a footprint greater than the continental United States? Because you would have been thinking in 1950s terms of what a computer device was. All right, these devices will be infinitely small, part of the fabric of our existence. That's how far we've come. Now let's see how far we can go. And I have to tell you that when I, when I think about this, when I, when I try to understand what these behaviors will look like, I have to give up. Because the behavioral piece of it is something we negotiate as a society. All I can do is give you glimpses into some of the things that I think are gonna influence that behavior. So, to that point, should we just look at the future? Can I show you what it's gonna look like? Or we just circumvent the next 45 minutes and go right to it? You ready for this? Thank you for dimming the lights, lovely, great effect. This is what the future will look like. This is my son, Adam. Surrounded by screens uh, all the time, at least three or four of them, plus his mobile devices. And just by way of reference, because I wanna give you a framework here, this is NORAD, this is Adam. Do you see a difference? Because I sure as hell don't. And we would have, I don't know if you've done this with your, with your kids, you know, on the one hand I've got my 93 year old dad, on the other hand I've got, I've got Adam, who is this incredible gamer, loves to game, will game for, you know, incessantly. What's the right amount of time to put a kid in front of a screen? How many hours? Per day, like 23, roughly? I mean, he'll forego, you know, food, yeah, you know, biological functions of the body, just a game. And I can recall vividly, and it's, it's his behavior that bothers me, right? This is a behavioral issue for me. It's aberrant behavior. And I can remember very vividly, one summer, it's, he's gone on summer break, and um, he's up in the attic, he's been gaming for God knows how many hours nonstop. And I go upstairs, it's summer break, beautiful day outside, and I said, Adam, I said, get the hell outside, come on, buddy. Get some vitamin D, go chase a squirrel, do something. And, and Adam looked at me and very respectfully didn't, you know, didn't jump up and say, I'm not going outside. He said, Dad, he said, what did you do during summer break before there were like computers? Like, how'd you stay busy? I was like, really, you little shit. Um, before there were computers, like just after the Stone Age when we put away the chisels and the hammers, I said, you know what, you're right. I didn't have a computer, I didn't have a mobile device. You, you know, your, your grandmother would send me off at the beginning of the day. Um, she wouldn't ask me to call her or text her or tell her where I was. She would simply say, bye. Off I'd go. And I'd come back at him for dinner. And I was out all day, we were building tree forts and, and bows and arrows and we were, we were chasing wild animals like squirrels and rabbits and that's what we were doing. Communing with nature. And Adam looks at me and says, um, says, you did that like what, all in the neighborhood there? I said, yeah, we had a like, little dead end street and we'd go off in the woods and that's where we would play. He goes, what's a dead end street? I said, it's kind of like a cul-de-sac. What's your point, kid? He says, you know what, dad? Can't make this up, right? Points to his screen and says, this is my cul-de-sac. The hell do you say to that as a parent? I said, get the hell outside, get some vitamin D, chase a squirrel, get out of here. Because he was making sense. This is his cul-de-sac. This is where his friends are. I'm going to throw him out into the world where he doesn't have any friends. 
What happens when we look at technology is we always think of it as sort of being subtracted to the human experience. And what it does is it's always additive, right? Adam doesn't just live in front of a monitor, as most of our kids don't, right? He does go outside, does work in the real world and play in the real world. But the reality is that this is an added dimension to how he socializes. This is his life. You know, whether I like it or not, whether it makes sense to me or not, you know, for him, this is the way he wants to interact. And as a result, he wants everything to have intelligence. Every device he interacts with has to be an intelligent device. This is an important point because we're going to come back to, to this. You know, I didn't have the luxury of that. I was out on my Schwinn, you know, Stingray bicycle, remember these things, uh, all day long. I didn't have that connectivity. But nonetheless, I sought it. I sought it on the cul-de-sac on the dead end street. Adam seeks it in his own cul-de-sac. And increasingly, this is this expectation, this generational expectation, which you have to take into consideration when you look at any industry. What is she doing? What's this beautiful little child doing? Anyone? Yeah, so to her, a uh, 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 magazine is a defective iPad, basically, right? And, and the, the, the most telling frame in this, and I love it, is this last frame where she's poking her finger into a pudgy little thigh. Brilliant child, the deduction being the finger is definitely working. It's the magazine that's broken, right? They come out of the womb somehow already tuned into this technology. I'm not sure how that happens. But this expectation set that everything has intelligence is absolutely critical to understanding how the future of any of these industries is going to work and how behaviors are ultimately going to change. Now, we're all not going to go willingly into that future. Some of us will go kicking and screaming, Kevin. Uh, and God bless you, Kennedy, for bringing your dad kicking and screaming into the future with the, with the app on, on, on the phone for this event. And by the way, for those of you that don't know what's going on, it's called Whiteout. Um, I have a nephew, Vernon, who, who once, I love to collect old typewriters, and he came into my office one time, and he was at the typewriter, he played around with it, he loves to play with an old typewriter, they don't get to use these things, right? He had no idea what it was. And, and Vernon says to me, uh, wow, this is so great. I, what if he made a mistake? And I showed him how whiteout works. He said, oh, that's really neat. But what if it was like a big mistake, Uncle Tom? And I said, you would actually cut the paper and you'd paste something new onto it. And he was like, whoa, cut and paste. I was like, yeah, dude, that's where it comes from. <laughs> whether you go kicking or screaming, the future is not going to ask whether you're willing to go into it. It's simply going to suck you in. And it'll do it in a way that ultimately you, you never book? expect. From Look at these ads away. that were run by AT&T, and I want Across you to think when were these ads run? What year was it? So you're seeing GPS technology here. Directions. Incredibly prescient. This is how we live today. Tablet-based computing. They called it sending a fax from the beach, right? Using the, the vocabulary of the past or the future. Uh, electronic Carry medical records, which is what you're seeing here, right? Imaging and diagnostics that are today being done in virtually every provider institution. WebEx, Zoom. What year did AT&T air these incredibly pressing ads of what 2020 would look like today? In a minute, you're going to see Netflix. What year was it? Anyone? The minute you wanted to. 85, I'm hearing. I heard someone say 70 something. 88. It was 1993. In 1993, we thought this was the George Jetson future. And here's the punchline. Even though AT&T knew exactly what 2023 would look like and 2024 now in 1993, they didn't bring a single one of these products to market. How's that happen? How can you see the future that clearly, the technological future, and yet not capitalize on it? And the answer to that is what they saw was the trajectory of technology, not the trajectory of adoption and behavior. Right? Today, you sleep with this device. It is that intimate, and it's that critical to your survival. That was what AT&T couldn't foresee, and which, as a society, we negotiated over time. So we all live within this thing called the cone of plausibility. This cone of plausibility defines the parameters. Sometimes they're regulatory parameters. They're not always our choosing. But sometimes they're generational parameters. They're parameters based on the investment we've made in plant and equipment and machinery. Sometimes there are parameters that are cultural, based on what we've adopted and what we've grown up with. But these parameters, this cone of plausibility, defines the degree to which we can innovate. And what we usually end up doing is building a value axis around this. So when Kevin said, you know, information, technology is your core strategy, what he's defining is a new value axis. It's the second arrow that you see pointing up at a much steeper angle. 
right, the old value axis changes to a new value axis. And as it does, your strategy changes, your go-to-market changes, your investment profile changes, virtually everything about how you approach a business and run a business and monetize a business changes as a result of that value axis change. And what I tell industries is that if you miss that value axis change, you miss the once in a lifetime opportunity to transform whatever business you're in. And this happens in every single industry. And sometimes those transformations are triggered by the silliest things that we look back in retrospect and say, you know what, that, I, that was the, the, the spark that ignited the blaze. The reason we have GPS is not because someone invented GPS technology, it's because Ronald Reagan, when Korean Air uh, 007 went down, was shot down by a Russian MiG, realized that the military had GPS technology, but commercial airliners did not. That was the trigger event. That was the spark that ignited GPS. That's why you have Waze on your phone today. So these inflection points that shoot us out of this cone of possibility are the single most important thing to understand. And you know the best way to identify those? And Jack Welch did this. I'm glad you brought Jack Welch up, Kevin. Jack Welch had every one of his 60 senior managers mentored by a new hired college graduate. Those 60 execs didn't like that program but it was mandated by Welch. Why would he mandate it? And this, right as the internet was beginning to explode, because Welch realized that identifying a new value access wasn't gonna come from the old cultural norms, from the, way, from the way we did behave. It would come from understanding new opportunities presented by the internet. So what I wanna look at with you in the remaining time we have is, is how some of these cornerstone trends, what I call the gigatrends, are gonna fundamentally shift the way you look at your industry, the way you invest in your industry, the way you grow your industry, and ultimately how we create a sustainable agriculture industry that will, able, that will be able to feed the additional four billion people that we're gonna be adding to the planet, or two billion, whatever, wherever we cap off at. The popular theme is about 10 billion, and Kevin, I, yeah, I'm like you, I'm not sure we're gonna actually hit that number at this point as soon as we thought we would, but I'm gonna show you some demographic trends that'll scare the daylights out of you. Um, and they scared me when I first saw them. So let's start going down this. So let's, let's start by looking at, at data. So when I think of what the future will look like, much of it will be driven by data. Strategy as well as your operations and your industrial internet of things and your autonomous devices, all this will be driven by, by data. The more data you have, the more likely you are to have AI that can make inferences as a result, as a result of it. The reason we have AI today that works so damn well is in part because technology has improved so we have better algorithms and better neural networks to base that on, but more so because we have the data to feed the damn thing. We didn't have enough data. So how much data? So look at this. I've got three wedges here. The lowest wedge is a 40% uh, year-over-year growth rate. Um, the second wedge is a 70% year-over-year growth rate, and the third, the top wedge, is 100% year-over-year growth rate. What this shows is the increase in the number of bits of data over time. And these numbers are actually accelerating as well. So we made an investment in a local uh, company in Boston, a unicorn in Boston, that uh, provides cloud data storage. And we put together these projections initially about five years ago. We updated them yearly. And what we're seeing is an increase, not a decrease. So that 40% that year-over-year growth rate with our baseline wedge today, we're at a 45% year-over-year growth rate baseline wedge. So the others are a bit more optimistic, but we're growing at 45% year-over-year in terms of the data that we have. Those horizontal lines, the dotted lines, are the number of atoms that make up the Earth, the solar system, and the universe. So if you want to have fun with this by 2200, more or less, if we grow at 100% year-over-year growth, we will have more bits of data than there are atoms that make up the visible universe. Again, absurd, right? But we're seeing things right now with quantum computing and quantum storage that will allow us to get to that point. We don't know how, but nature works that way. There are ways that we can create more bits of data than there are atoms that make up the universe. I'm not smart enough to tell you exactly how that's going to happen, but I'm pretty sure we'll figure that one out. The real question is, what do we do with this data? And the answer is, this is what will feed, this is the fuel, this is the oil boom that will feed AI. What I hope to show you and, and prove to you, at least as best we can in the course of an hour or so, is how AI is an absolute necessity for global sustainability. We're not gonna be able to build a planet that can feed all 10 billion people 
without AI. That's not possible. We won't be able to transport 10 billion people without AI. We won't be able to give identity to 10 billion people without AI. All of this is going to be contingent on us having a data foundation on top of which we can build these AI engines to somehow uh, help us deal with an entirely different reality. And here is one of the most significant shifts in that reality. Uh, Kevin, you talked about this a little bit, but I want to show it to you in a very visceral way. And again, if this doesn't scare the daylights out of you, nothing will. Uh, you are a very cold-hearted person if this doesn't scare you. So what I'm going to show you is a time lapse of population. This is a classic population pyramid that demographers use to describe population. This is global. We'll start in 1950. We were about 2.5 billion. And we're going to time lapse up through 2100. And then I'm going to show you some geographic demographic trends that really drive the point home in terms of how fragile we are as a global economy based on these demographic shifts. So males on the left, uh, females on the, uh, on the right, each band is five years. Each band is five years. Start in 1950, and let's do the time lapse. So what you see as we get into the 60s and the 70s, the bottom begins to bulge a little bit. It's the classic thing that we've grown up with. So we see this in our mind's eye. This is not the world we live in today. What we're seeing now is the formation of a dome. And that dome, over time, becomes what demographers affectionately call uh, a, a population tombstone effect. That dome almost goes away. You end up with kind of like a skyscraper model. And by the time we get to the 2060s, 2070s, you have less than one percentage point delta difference between the zero through five age band and that 60 through 65 age band. So my challenge to you, and this is global, except for two geographies, which I'm going to touch on, which are really critical to so much of what you folks do. Two geographies that absolutely need to be paid attention to. But before I go there, this is the developed world. This is the developing world. Except for the two geos that I'm about to talk about, this is what the entire world will look like. What happens to social welfare? I mean, how do you educate, much less feed all these people? You don't have that base of workers, uh, of, of muscle. And I, the pyramid analogy is a wonderful one because when people say, you know, how do we build the pyramids? Hell, you have enough human beings, you can build pretty much anything in enough time. We're losing that pyramid. What has defined society for 5,000 plus years in terms of the demographic profile is gonna change dramatically. Labor shortages? Oh, hell, absolutely. Especially at the bottom of that pyramid. Um, will you ever retire? <laughs> Good luck with that. You know, by 2100, our life expectancy is increasing, but so is our work life expectancy. 2100, the two lines intersect. Work life intersects with life expectancy. What does that mean? You're working not, not, not till you're dead, after you're dead. Like you keep working after you're dead. Great retirement plan, right? Um, this is pretty damn significant. What are the two geos? One geo is gonna have a perfect pyramid, will be in the most enviable position of any geography in the world when it comes to having a perfect uh, population pyramid. Which geo is that? What am I talking about? Someone's in Texas, no, it's not Texas. <laughs> um, anyone? Africa. Africa is going to have a, a perfect uh, population pyramid. It, it's, it is frightening how um, it's going to maintain that shape. So this is the, the, the African pyramid that you're going to see. I think this is circa around 20, uh, 2050 or, or thereabouts. So they're going to maintain that pyramid shape. Which one scares the daylights, should scare the daylights out of all of us? Because we really don't want them to go belly up. Because if they do, they're going to start doing stuff that people do when they go belly up that isn't necessarily rational. Who am I talking about? Damn right, China, yeah. This is what China's gonna look like. China will have half its population by 2100 if it continues at this rate. And, and you know what, except for a, like a, a much worse, a 10X pandemic of what we experienced or, or a world war, nothing is gonna change this. And even those events only make it you know, oscillate. It always goes back to the, to the mean. So this is what China's gonna look like. What do you do when you don't have an immigration policy and your population is halved? What do you do? Yeah, I, I don't want to begin answering that question, right? So we're at a very fragile point where we have to look much more seriously at some of the things that for a long time we've simply accepted. So when you folks talk about yield, when we talk about productivity in, in other industries, and I know productivity it certainly applies to, to, to agriculture as well, but when you talk about things like yield, 
I focus on where is the friction, where is the waste, how do we change that yield equation in a way that we can make your business that much more efficient? How do we avert the labor crisis uh, that, we're, that we're currently in that's only going to get worse? How do we deal with the global uncertainty that creates volatility in supply chains that makes it so difficult to plan and to predict? what we're going to do next month, much less next, next year. So these are the things that ultimately, as we, as we look at this crazy new future, right, these, these, these math equations that just don't make sense. How do we store that much data? We're going to be living after we're dead. All these things that we, you know, we laugh at them today because they kind of grate on us. Like, that doesn't make any sense, Tom. I get it. The future really makes sense until you're living in it. You know, at that point, suddenly you realize how the things that you do, the behaviors that you have, the phone that you sleep with, is something that you couldn't live without because this makes your life much more not just productive, but much more enjoyable. So what does that future look like? Understand that we're building all of this within this enormous context of uncertainty. And I remember back in, in 2001, just after the attacks on 9-11, one of my mentors and all of you should have mentors or be mentors, right? Mentoring is not teaching someone a damn thing. Mentoring is just giving someone the confidence they need to go the next step. Everyone, if you don't have a mentor, find a mentor. Just ask the question, would you? Find someone you respect that's outside of your circle and ask them, would you be my mentor? Half of them will say no. Half of them will kind of hem and haw. One out of 10 might say, yeah, sure. Uh, my mentoring relationships that I've had on both ends as a mentor and, 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 and being mentored have been the most valuable experiences of my life. Not a single door that's open for me has not opened because of that. So either be a mentor or ask for a mentor. Enough preaching. One of my mentors, uh, Peter Drockworth, father of, of modern management uh, theory, and I had a conversation just after 9-11, and I said, you know, where are we? I feel so lost, like the playbook's been taken away from me. Any private pilots? How many private pilots in the room? How many of you were around during 9-11? A few of you? When I saw that so private pilot, when I saw that first plane in that first tower, I thought for sure it was a Cessna, just kind of, you know, some guy who does something really stupid. When that second plane hit, someone took the playbook away from me. It was like playing chess with the three-year-old, right, where the king leaves the room and doesn't come back. I'm going to make up the rules. Your rules don't apply anymore. That's kind of what it felt like. And that's what uncertainty does to us, right? Uncertainty creates enormous emotional toll. If we look at Ukraine and what's happening there, it's not just the economic consequences which are quite severe and very real. The human toll is an emotional toll that it takes on all of us. And we are, I, I submit to you, we are in this prolonged period. Uncertainty is not going to go down. So what happens? And Kevin, you talked about this too, the importance of those 10 data points. You know, today I'm throwing thousands of data points at you saying, figure this out. And you're saying, whoa, 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 I don't have the time to go through 1,000 data points. What are the 10 data points? Here's what that looks like. And Kevin and I, we didn't co collaborate on this beforehand, but I love the setup. Thank you so much for bringing this up because I couldn't agree more. As human beings, our capacity is very finite. We need the 10 deterministic variables, right? The ones that make a difference. And if you're good at what you do, if you're a good leader, if, if you're good at what you do, you know what those deterministic variables are. But here's what's happening over time we have less and less time within which to take action to make the decision. Complexity increases, volatility increases, global uncertainty increases, economic uh, uh, markets uh, are volatile, and what happens there obviously gets more complex, but opportunity doesn't go away. You just have to make the decision in a shorter and shorter period of time. While that's happening, our time to react goes up because we have more and more data with which to make the decision. And I would say that right now we're at that intersection point, we're at this choke point. I don't need any more data. No, but what we do need is to reduce the friction, reduce the waste, reduce the errors, right? Increase yield, increase productivity, do all these wonderful things. And to do that, we are going to need to bridge that gap, the assistance of technology. Technology in this future becomes a collaborator. And one of the things I want you to take away from this, I'd like you to take away from this. I mean, take away from it what you want, but what I'd like you to take away from it is that technology, especially in the form of AI, is not an us or them. It is a collaborator. And when you implement, whether it's, it's, you know, it's, it's Deere's ADAR tractor or whether it's some kind of drone technology that's, um, that's allowing you to, to, to observe your crops or whether it's soil sampling and, and censoring, whatever it is, that is a collaborator. And deploy it, implement it, apply it as you would a collaborator. You'll, you'll see a bit more about this as I get more into this conversation. But don't look at it as technology. Look at it as something you collaborate with. 
right? The little girl with the magazine, right? The collaboration, the intelligence, the shared experience. That gap beyond that choke point has to be bridged by AI. And it's not just ag. This is in every industry I talk to. Every industry, it's the, it's the same issue, right? Our decision time is being inflated because we have more and more information. How do we make decisions quickly in the time that, we, that, we're, that, we're, that we've been given to take advantage of that opportunity? And here's, I think, the biggest piece of that answer is that the future of work is gonna become much more collaborative between us and technology. Remember I said to you, start using chat GPT? There's not a lot of things that I can predict with high certainty, but within 10 years, you will never again use a graphical user interface. Never. For whatever you're doing, you will simply be talking to a device. And that device will be your personal assistant who knows you. It won't be Google knowing you, or Apple knowing you, or Facebook knowing you better than you know yourself. It'll be your personal digital twin, your digital self knowing you better than you know yourself. And that digital self, will also exist for every piece of machinery you own, for every crop you have, for every potato, for every ear of corn. All of those will be intelligent devices in this, in this mesh that we're talking about. All will have a digital self. Deere uses this terminology, by the way. I mean, I've been using it for about 10, 10 years or so now. But Deere has started using this, this terminology of digital self and digital twin. Uh, they talk about digital ecosystems, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Uh, and, and the importance of building an ecosystem with what I'm about to describe. So think in a purely collaborative sense. So what do we have today? We have the value of labor and we have the value of results. So much of what we do is operational. It's output based. The value of labor is relatively low in terms of the skill set that you need, but we have to put human beings on that because for the time being it still makes economic sense to do that. Over time, what happens, however, we move towards more of an outcome-based. Outcome-based is, have I improved yield? Have I improved my bottom line? Right? Those are outcomes that are important to your business and how you run your business. Uh, am I getting a return on my, on my investment? The operational stuff is how you get to that point, how you realize those outcomes. So what do we do over time? We move the humans further and further up into that right-hand quadrant. And digital workers become the front line. I am working with at least half a dozen companies now that are in this digital worker space. Within five years, forget 10, within five years, there won't be a single entry-level job on Wall Street. Every single bank is flocking to this technology. Uh, so financial services, accounting. My first degree was in, was in accounting. Um, dear Lord, you, know, you won't be able to get a job as an accountant coming out of school. It, just, it won't be there. It won't be there. And we can, you can push back on that all you want, please. But from what I'm seeing, it, this is going to be the most radical shift in how we work in labor that has occurred during any of our lifetimes. And ultimately, you push it all the way, the human element all the way up to the upper right-hand quadrant. It's purely outcome-based, high-value labor. What does that look like? I think you kind of know what this looks like, right? So if we look at it in, in your environment, right, I've got a control room uh, where everything is being managed remotely. I've got drones. Uh, that are helping me observe my, my, my crops so I can see firsthand what's going on in my fields. Right? I've got harvesters, I've got, I've got, I've got applications of uh, fertilizer and, 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 and soil sensors that are telling me what to add to the soil. All this being done from this control room. This is exactly what healthcare looks like today. You know, my last book, book 12, was about, was about healthcare. And I talked to hospitals, I looked at what's, what's going on there, and I was amazed by the fact that the leading edge hospitals, they have these control rooms, sort of like a, like a uh, control tower at an airport, where they can see what's going on in every patient's room. They can see what's going on in the hospital. They can predict when a patient's going to fall out of bed before they fall out of bed, not after they fall out of bed, which is what's happening today. Right? This is the, the direction that every industry is going in. The problem with that upper right-hand quadrant is that you've got to trust what's going on in all those other quadrants, and that's a tough one. That is a really tough one. I was talking to someone earlier, uh, David, thanks for the conversation. We were talking about building co-ops so that you can achieve some economies of scale as a small or a medium-sized farmer uh, to give you the leverage you need to negotiate better, to actually create these environments. I'm going to suggest that what this upper right-hand quadrant is, is agriculture in the cloud. That's the term I would use. I've, I've talked about agri you know, the, the notion of, of how agriculture is very much a community-based business, and I realize it is for many of you. But it's this notion of pushing everything up into the cloud so that there's a shared experience, a shared data set, and a way to sort of you know, realize this vision. This is a John Deere ad. This is probably about, this is pre-pandemic, I think, actually. 
right? So the technology's been there. Um, I worked with Peterbilt. Peterbilt has a level four, level five, which is the highest level of autonomy uh, truck that can long haul coast to coast. But we see demos of these, well, why isn't anyone actually rolling one out? Why? Because if an autonomous vehicle has an accident, it makes the front page of every single paper. If you and I have an accident, no one knows about it, except for the folks that we know. Right? No one wants to be that front page news. So there's this element of trust that, that's hugely difficult, I think, to, to embrace until you've gone through it. And this is why the generational piece of it is so damn important. Moving agriculture to the cloud is a generational shift. And I know many of you are multi-generational operations. I know a lot of you are, are younger and are, are working in, in, in agriculture and in farming right now and bringing great ideas to it. But a lot of it is not the lack of good ideas. It is, as with e every case of leadership, it is getting the hell out of the way. My son says to me, you boomers, you, you, you guys just got to retire. You have to retire. You got to do it. So you can just get the hell out of the way and let us take control. And he's right. You know, our legislature, our geriatric legislature isn't definitely helping the cause any. You see these folks have, you know, a testimony on Capitol Hill with, with technologists. It scares the day, that's worse than nuclear war. That scares the daylights out of me. It's like these people are running the country. So it, it is a generational shift. What does that agriculture in the cloud look like? So what I see happening here is we've, we've moved from purely on-site computing, this lower left-hand quadrant of, of this framework that you're seeing here, as complexity of farming has increased and generally agriculture has increased along with supply chains, we have all these silos, and again, Kevin, you talked about this, you know, the, the siloing is, is a constant phenomenon in, in technology applications, where everything that you do, and there's many more vectors here than I'm gonna illustrate, become siloed applications. And those siloed applications all exist in the cloud, but individually. This is the problem with healthcare and medical records. Right? I've got medical records, but I've got a dozen of them, and I can't share them from one provider to another. If I go into an ER, you know, God forbid, here in Kansas City, they have no idea who I am. I'm an anonymous patient, right? Data siloing creates anonymity, but it also creates friction. That's the bottom line. Uh, I remember doing an event uh, at, with um, Terry Lundgren, who used to be the CEO at Macy's, and CEOs and chairman of uh, 50 of the largest corporations in the U.S., and asking them what the single biggest challenge they faced was, whether it was retail or tech or automotive or aerospace, it was the same thing. How do we drive the friction out of our operation? How do you drive the friction out of your operation? And the answer to that is almost always technology. I say almost always because technology can add a level of friction as well, and it will. There's a learning curve, there's ramp up. Um, but ultimately what I see in this, this agriculture and this cloud, this farm and the cloud phenomenon, is this building of a digital ecosystem. Digital ecosystems will be the fundamental construct of tomorrow's organization. I teach at Boston University, and one of the things I teach my graduate students is that if you want to understand the organization of tomorrow, understand this notion of a digital ecosystem and how it will work. The problem with most digital ecosystems in agriculture is that they're not only siloed by application, but they're siloed by farm. So imagine, I know you compete with each other, but are there things that you could share in the cloud that would make farming better for all of you, increase productivity and yield, be a win-win, all boats rise with a rising tide kind of thing um, that doesn't somehow impinge on that competitive nature which is, which is intrinsic to any, any free market economy. Right? That's the shift, right? How do you move that into the cloud so you can benefit from it, so that you can reduce that time to decision by having shared data sets an AI that will analyze the data in those, in those data sets. This is being done. Manufacturing has been doing this for a decade. E2Open, if you don't know about this, is one of the companies that I follow for some time. Um, E2Open has these digital control towers, and they were the ones that effectively worked to build the, the 777, the Boeing 777, which was done entirely online, digitally. Uh, if you had a supplier that couldn't supply parts, they would plug in and instantly a new supplier. So the supply chain had agility built into it that was AI-driven. Uh, Tesla today uh, can geofence an area and diagnose behaviors of a community of drivers. Believe it or not, communities have driving behaviors. They can fine tune the, tar the car to that community behavior. Right? Crossing these, these silos is absolutely critical. In autonomous devices, autonomous devices need to share data. That's the way they learn. Right? We learn as human beings by sharing data. That is the way AI learns, is by sharing this data across these, these silos. So what does that do? It moves us from 
this old model of the organization where everything was about product and ownership, which I know it still is in much of agriculture, but I'm trying to show you how this is shifting across the board and how I think it will have to shift for agriculture as well, to this digital ecosystem, right? This, this farm in the cloud where data is shared, going from a scarcity model to a model of, of abundance. Um, not only does productivity uh, improve, does friction get reduced, does waste get reduced, does yield get increased, but ultimately you have a model that's much more pleasant to work within, right? where you actually have greater control, greater ability to respond, greater ability to predict. So if what you're doing is something that you're passionate about, being able to do it better should give you greater passion, I think. In all of this are these digital selves, these digital twins. So not only is your entire farm a digital twin, but you can run experiments on that farm. I mean, part of where NVIDIA is going with this technology and where AI is ultimately gonna lead us is having the ability with our smart devices uh, to do work that is simulated. That doesn't actually affect the crop, but shows us what would happen to the crop if we did A, B, and C to it. If the following weather conditions occurred. And then asking the question, how likely are those conditions? And therefore, how do I hedge my bets and make sure that I have the best plan going forward for the next 12 months for my crops, next 24 months, as far as the AI will take us. These digital cells will be pervasive. You will have a digital self that will be your healthcare advocate. So when you walk into a hospital, if you can't communicate, it'll have all your records, all your history, everything right there. And it'll be able to communicate with the clinicians and the docs to tell them what's going on, what your history is, what other conditions you have, what comorbidities you have, uh, what drugs you're allergic to, all the stuff that you might not be able to, to share if you're compromised. One of the areas that I think is central to this industry and what you're doing, because I see so much attention being paid to it, and there was the comment Kevin made about deer. I've done work with Caterpillar as well, uh, with the trucking companies like Peterbilt. I, I see this, the technology is there. We are ready to go to full autonomy. Uh, the car I drive is relatively autonomous, and it's, it's made me very lazy when it comes to driving. And I can already see how that laziness is changing the experience for me. Transportation for me is no longer about getting from point A to point B. There's a pleasantness to it. Uh, almost an entertainment value to it. And car manufacturers want to build entertainment platforms. The car will be a platform where you go to socialize. You go for wellness. I'm not kidding. You know, you, you walk in, this becomes a device that tells the car who you are. The lighting changes, the music changes, the seat massage changes, everything changes to tune into your frequency, your mood that day perhaps. Right. High intimacy. Again, the girl with the iPad, right? Changing the devices that the intelligence respects who we are. It's no longer about brand loyalty. I'm not loyal to the brand. The brand is loyal to me because the brand gets me. It knows who I am. So back to this framework again. So we're moving from what I call economies of scale, and those will never go away. There's always leverage buying power in economies of scale. But we're introducing this notion of economies of scope. An economy of scope is an efficient economy where you can do things that you couldn't have done in the past without that technology. So as a small farmer, you can be much more effective um, than you ever could have been and can compete with larger operations based on, on efficiencies that you're able to, to achieve. So we move from that Henry Ford model to something else in this upper right-hand model. So from a transportation standpoint, what will that upper right-hand model look like? And this is where I've done a lot of work, and I can give you some speculation. Um, I'm not 100% convinced, but I'm pretty well convinced this is where we're going. In that upper right-hand model, you will no longer own your automobile. You won't want to own your automobile, and your insurance company won't let you own an automobile. You will look back, I guarantee you, in 10, 20 years, and your kids will certainly look back, and they will say, dear Lord, mom or dad, you put me in front of a car at 16? Were you nuts? You let me drive this, this, this you know, machine of death and destruction. It'll be inconceivable that we put our kids in those cars. They're just too damn dangerous with human beings behind the wheel. So as we move into that upper right-hand quadrant, you know, we're kind of tempted. So is it Tesla? It's not Tesla, not in its current form. Musk is doing a huge head fake here um, with owned versus non-owned cars. I'll tell you more about that in a second, but it's not Tesla. It's not some of the driverless taxis that you're seeing. Um, it's not gonna be Google with, with, uh, with their version of, 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 of autonomous vehicle. Um, it's something entirely different. And here's the data that shows you what that's gonna look like. So a few years back, we were commissioned by IBM to do a large study of the transportation and energy sector. And we looked at the total number of vehicles that exist 
So today we're at about 250,000. This is, this is not commercial. This is just the, we did the commercial side as well. This is just the, the um, uh, consumer side of, of transportation. Um, so what you see is ICE vehicles, internal combustion engines going down and precipitously going down once we get to sort of the 2030s or so. You see electric vehicles going up, but then something really peculiar happens because both EVs and ICE take a nosedive somewhere after the uh, 2035. 2035, does that ring a bell? California, fifth largest economy in the world, decides it's gonna go all electric. US federal government, 2035, decides all federal government vehicles will be electric, right? Autonomy is gonna be forced down in our throats because economically it makes absolute perfect sense. But what happens to energy use? Through the roof, right? We have much higher utilization and that utilization basically means that you could have one of these cars driving 24-7, or at least 23-7, or 22-7, or whatever the case is, as opposed to two hours a day, which is what we get today with most, with most automobiles. That increased utilization drives up the use of, of energy, um, and nearly quadruples, or more than quadruples, over the course of that same time period. You will not own a car, there will be no more driveways, no more parking garages, no more parking spaces, Cars will own themselves on the blockchain, they'll maintain themselves. The whole notion of owning a car, other than for purposes having to do with a hobby or whatever, all of that will go, will go away. Radically different view of the world. And this is within earshot. Because we're talking 2035 as a serious tipping point. By then the battery technology, which is being worked on feverishly, uh, will certainly be, be resolved. Uh, by then, autonomy and true driverless vehicles that are level five, where they can do anything a human can do in any conditions, a human can do that and probably a little bit more, uh, will be available so every car that's autonomous will drive better than any one of us possibly could, or all of us put together possibly could. Very different world, right? And, and, and this, you know, this notion of autonomous devices, I think, is, is central to how so much of what you're doing is gonna change. Initially, I think those autonomous devices will be much more moderate. Drone technology is much more promising from what I can see um, than a lot of the high-end equipment that DEER is trying to, to push because that requires a much greater investment and a much greater trust factor, obviously. So again, that value axis shifts. Here's what's stopping it, though. So a, a fully autonomous, this is not an autonomous Peter built. this is one of their other trucks, but like a kid in, the, in a toy factory when I, when I was visiting with them. Um, beautiful machines these trucks are. But to store the data in an autonomous Peterbilt level four, level five, it would cost you three to $30 million. I mean, that eight hour cost, what, $500,000, $800,000 or thereabouts, the autonomous John Deere tractor? Right? You're gonna spend 30 times that much to store the data. It's ridiculous. Which is why the only folks that are playing in this space are folks that have access to huge data centers right now. So a lot's gonna have to happen. This is not a five to 10 year, this is more like a 10 to 20 year process. The other issue is that in the US, regulation is gonna inhibit a lot of this. I think we have to lobby hard to make sure that we're not behind the curve as we were with mobile devices for a long time compared to the rest of the world. All right, so there's a leapfrog effect here and a lot of our regulation is gonna slow the introduction of this autonomous technology, I'm afraid. So far what I see the government doing is actually quite positive. Uh, in, in terms of the, the transportation uh, edict and, and regulation. So I hope we continue in that direction and, and don't get overwhelmed by the social sentiment that happens when you do have an autonomous vehicle that has an accident. On balance, we're gonna save millions of lives with, with these devices. So we, we made quite a journey. Let me, let me bring this back to you. The final piece to this puzzle, whenever you talk about the future, you're talking about change. We don't know exactly what form it'll come in, you know, from, from the whiteout to the quantum computer and somewhere in between, there are things that we are gonna have to learn to adjust to. These devices, the role they play in our lives, the behaviors that we exhibit. And we have to make a very conscious choice to change that behavior. How does that happen? How does that conscious choice to change behavior happen? And there's one word and one word that epitomizes this, and I'll give you two quick vignettes of how that, of how that plays out. Did we lose signal on the video? The first vignette has to do with, um, it's on my laptop and I'm not getting it on the confidence monitor, guys. So the first vignette has to do with John Antioco, who was the CEO at Blockbuster, 
right? So Blockbuster was Netflix's nemesis. Uh, Reed Hastings was the CEO, still is and was at that time. They had just gone public. Uh, the CEO as well of, uh, of, of, of Netflix. So Reed is having a conference call with the Wall Street analysts after they've gone public. And he didn't know this, but John Antioco, who had purchased some stock in, um, uh, in Netflix to be able to sit in on some of their uh, annual meetings and get their annual reports and what have you, he was also eavesdropping on the call. And during the call, one of the Wall Street analysts asked Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, early on, when Netflix was just going to, to DVD-based delivery and thinking about digital delivery, said, hey, you know, the Wall Street analyst talking now, said, Reed, what about Blockbuster? You know, they're still a nemesis, right? They're, they're still definitely something to contend with. They're a force. What are you going to do about them? And Reed said, you know what? They've thrown everything at us but the kitchen sink, and we're still here standing. End of call. Everyone gets off the call. And at that point, John Antioco decides he's going to do something kind of clever. Next morning, Reed Hastings shows up at Netflix's offices, and waiting for him is a FedEx box addressed from John Antioco, CEO of Blockbuster, addressed to Reed Hastings. You want to guess what was in the box? About this big. A stainless steel kitchen sink. God's honest truth, right? Imagine the supreme arrogance. Now, what's amazing about this is that Netflix and Blockbuster had the same technology. I mean, Blockbuster had the ability to deliver digitally. They decided not to. Why? Because they invested in infrastructure, industrial era infrastructure. Can't get rid of plant equipment and materials and real estate that easily, can you? Same problem Kodak had. I mean, we can go on and on and on down the list here. It is that arrogance of putting your best and brightest on the life support systems of the past rather than on the innovation of the future. This isn't about life support. To some degree, we have to swap the engines out while the plane is flying. We know that. We understand that. So there's going to be overlap here. But it's about building that trust factor in technology, building that trust factor in, in the future. When I first started using Waze, I would always second guess it. Wouldn't you? Like, it's taking me down a neighborhood I don't want to go down. I'm going to go my way. And then I get stuck in traffic for half an hour and bitch and moan. And next time, I trust Waze a little bit more. At this point, Waze, take me wherever you want. I'm totally okay with it. If, if the signal dies, I'm pretty much on my own, I get it, but I'm gonna follow you to hell and back. I trust you that much. That's what happens with every technology. We get to the point where we can't live without it, and we wonder how we live without it going back. What is it that fosters that kind of behavior, ultimately? What, what allows us, gives us agency, latitude, and space within which to be innovative? What is it, anyone? It's the last lesson I want to leave you with. It's leadership. Right? Leadership is what gives us agency. It's, it's as, as a family leader, as a farm leader, as the leader of, of an investment group, whatever, whether you're leading a portfolio or people, I don't, it is the ability to give agency to people to make mistakes, to innovate, to do things differently that ultimately allows change to happen. It's why we admire folks like Welch as much as, as, much as we did. Um, so, as we, as we look at this, let me just skip ahead here. I want to show you one last thing here before I let you go. The, the image I most want you to keep in mind is, is the following. And this is a simple one. It's going to be a familiar one as well. I know you've, you've seen this and you will recognize this very quickly. The role of leadership is to help us let go of the past. Sometimes to break the future but more so to give us that agency to, to depart from the trajectory, to get off the rails. And here's what it looks like, or what it shouldn't look like, depending, you pick. Remember this scene from the Titanic? This is when they spot the iceberg. And it's, it's, we love the story because there's so much that went wrong up until this point in time, right? The bulkheads weren't wide, wide enough, uh, not enough sea doors, not enough lifeboats, uh, low quality slag in the rivets bad meteorological conditions, uh, Captain Smith overly zealous and you know, flooring it to get uh, to the States as quickly as possible to set a new record. But the, the fate of the Titanic was sealed in the instant that the chief engineer ordered the three screws to go full astern. Three screws meant three propellers. This thing could pivot. It didn't pivot because 
right there, engaged and reversed the engines. That sealed the fate of the Titanic. From the time they saw the iceberg, and I write about this in Gigatrends, till the time they could take action was measured in seconds. They had about 13 to 17 seconds, depending on how you measure this, that they could have taken action. And they could have pivoted. They could have pivoted around the iceberg if they had put one screw into full astern and one full forward. They did not do that. They gently sideswiped the iceberg, and we know how the story ends. What I want you to remember from all this is not that the behaviors were inappropriate, not that they were some kind of cultural legacy that the captain was trying to hold on to to, to cement his, his legacy in, in the history of, of the annals of, of, of seamanship. What I want you to remember is just the look on this first officer's face. Befuddled, why isn't she turning? Why am I not departing from the past? See that look? Commit it to memory? Do yourself a favor. If you ever, ever are in a situation where you see this look in the eyes of leadership, get the hell off the damn boat. It is not going to turn out well. It is that befuddled expression. What, you know, John Antioco at Blockbuster, why aren't we doing better? Kodak, why aren't they buying film? I go on and on. The reality is at the end of the day, when that value axis shifts, we have to shift as well. We have no choice. Who said it? Everything that can be invented has been invented. Charles Dill, Commissioner of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, circa 1899. Right? Imagine the supreme arrogance of holding on to that belief when you're on the precipice of the greatest era of humanity when it comes to innovation and invention. We don't believe it, and yet we behave it. Right? Your role in building the future of agriculture is really, in many ways, to build new behaviors. New behaviors that will govern a new industry that will be able to find sustainability and to truly feed the planet. What an incredible undertaking, um, what an enviable undertaking. Thank you so much for having me here. I hope I've had a little bit of insight to your day. So much enjoyed being with you, and I'll be around to take some questions later on uh, if you'd like one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you again.